Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Always an Expat, a podcast for British expats in America by British expats in America, dedicated to elevating expat stories whilst helping equip us to make the most of our opportunity, brought to you by fellow British expat, yours truly, Richard Taylor. My guest today is Hal Berry. Hal is just down the road from me in Connecticut. He is a facilitator and keynote speaker to FTSE 250 and Fortune 500 companies, as well as the founder of ScreenwritingJourney.com, which is a book and video training platform helping aspiring screenwriters to achieve success. Now, Hal came to America in 2008 as the sales director for the FT newspaper and FT.com. Then the world crashed, as I'm sure we all remember, and Hal was made redundant in 2009. This led to a new career as a phys- as a facilitator and a public speaker, delivering uh, a public speaker, and ultimately the launch of ScreenwritingJourney.com. So, as I'm sure you can imagine by reading between the lines, this is truly a story of encountering challenges and rising to the occasion. This is classic expat stuff, and it's this kind of stuff that makes expats so compelling to me, and hopefully to you also. I'm really excited to get into this one, but before we get going, I'm just going to get the boring stuff out of the way. Always an Expat is not a financial podcast, it's a podcast about the expat journey, specifically being a Brit in the US, but it is brought to you by Plan First Wealth. Plan First Wealth is a business I founded and run today, and we work with successful British expatriates living across the US, people like the boys and girls who feature on this show, and we help them make the most opportunity, avoid the expat landmines, and one day retire happier, which is surely what it's all about. Now, with that being said... Whilst Plan First Wealth is an SEC registered investment advisor, the views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views and positions of Plan First Wealth. Information presented is for educational purposes only. Whew, right, I'm going to go and have a lie down after that. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's do this. Hi, Hal. Welcome to Always an Expat. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. It's getting, it's getting away from me, this intro, isn't it? I'm going to have to... <laughs> so the word facilitator to... seemed, to, seemed to get you, Richard. <laughs> it did. It's a killer. Uh, right. It, well, it is for me, apparently, but we've got Sam, <laughs> producer Sam. She'll, uh, she'll, she'll spruce that up, I'm sure, in post-production, <laughs> make me sound much better. Right. Okay. So, how you had quite the introduction there. There's a lot to unpack here. I'm really excited. You've, you've, you've been on a journey, right? This is what this podcast is all about. You've been yeah. on a journey. Yeah, so, and and a wonderful one, but uh, but yeah, absolute ups and downs, definitely. Well, you know, they, what what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. It is. Yeah. It, it, is and it sounds trite saying um, it's our challenges, it's difficulties, the unforeseen things that make us. It's trite. It's true. Um, but anyway, will you tell us in your own words? Give mm. us a give us a breakdown of of how we got here. So, uh, interesting, because I do actually end up giving this story a lot, of course. So as a facilitator and public speaker, you know, there's a lot of introducing to groups and who I am and what I do. So here is my honed one minute version of this. Uh, I was an actor when I was a kid. You can find me on IMDb. I went to check myself up. I'm actually 843,000 on the star meter today. So clearly that was not the career going to make me my money. But uh, uh, loved that. Thought I was going to be an actor. Then got into 20s, realized that was harder than I thought in your 20s, different to teenage acting. So uh, moved to writing, produced a couple of plays that did pretty well, decided I wanted to be a screenwriter. I I say poured myself into that, but one of the big problems was I never really worked hard enough at it. I thought it would just happen on its own if I wrote a couple of screenplays and sent them off. So eventually had to get real job jobs to pay bills. So I moved into sales was at a rather crappy magazine for a couple of years, but then ended up at the Financial Times newspaper, which was just a wonderful place to work. They liked me. They kept promoting me. It paid well. You know, I lived a nice life in London. It was it was great. But all the time, I really was still trying to be a screenwriter. That was what my evenings were spent doing. That was what I was, you know, trying to kickstart the career. But I kept getting more senior at the paper, and that takes up more and more of your time. And then in 2008, I actually had a couple of things going in the UK. I had a writing group, and we had a script that kept being commissioned, and, and uh, BBC had just bought it. Looked like it was going to happen, then didn't. And then basically my job kind of became redundant through nobody's fault. They bought a website. They didn't need me anymore, but everyone liked me a lot. And so Mm -hmm. rather than making me redundant, I basically said, why don't you just send me to America? So I'd been to New York when I was 14. I went back when I was 18 and I just adored it to bits. 
and and had this dream of living and working in Manhattan and what that would be like and all the movies that go with it and all the you know places I'd seen and so it was very lovely of them they said yeah okay let's do that so they put me on a six month secondment so I came over in April 2008 they paid for my apartment while I was here they did all the paperwork you know listening to your other episodes how we got here it was very easy literally they just did all the big company paperwork to move somebody over we were owned by Pearson at the time. I say we as if I still work at the newspaper, but uh, they were owned by Pearson. And so I came over and had that six months, and then they took me on full time. And so I, that was it. That, was, that wasn't going to be my life. So I sold everything I'd left in the UK to a friend of mine for £2,000. That was my entire life up to that point. And he took everything, and I moved here, and I got an apartment for myself. And, and then, yeah, six months after that, as the world crashed around us, they basically mm -hmm. said, we don't need you here anymore, Howell. And they offered to send me back home, not to the job. I was out of the job, but they offered to pay for me to get back to the UK. And I didn't want to go. I wanted to stay. I loved it. From the moment I got here, I just fell completely in love with it. Living and working in New York was everything I thought it was going to be. And so I didn't want to go. And I'd, I'd been seeing a very lovely woman. And it was a bit awkward because really I could only stay if we got married, but we'd only been seeing each other for three months. So it was this very sort of, well, what do we do now? Let's just stay and see what happens. So I spent the summer there. And then at the end of the summer, we decided let's, let's do this thing. So that was what kept me. And now? And what? And now are we still together? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry. Yeah, it was. It really was like her friends and family were honestly saying to her, "We don't trust this guy. Like he's he's after a green card." And so, fifteen years and two children later, they now trust what? me that I'm. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, Wait. It, it's either the longest con in the world, or we do actually love each other completely. So. Ah, uh, yeah, it's a pretty cool story that though. So. Three months, and I guess I'm, I'm imagining the conversation. So, what do you think we should do? No, you tell me what you what do you think we should well, do? I don't want to say it. <laughs> so, I mean, we sort of obviously laugh about it now. We actually met on our first day. She started at the paper the first day that I started in New York. I'd been there for nine years, obviously. She doesn't remember this at all. Apparently, I remember it, but but uh, we went. We met at the Christmas party that year, 2008. We went on our first date, and she told me months later but she texted her sister and said that's it i've just met the man i'm going to marry like no. she was she was into wow. it straight away it is a bit of a joke that i wasn't quite that definite that that early but but yeah we did that six months we did a trip to la and drove up to san francisco we did the proper like let's go on a big vacation and see if we yeah. still were like you, each were other you, were you in a, a convertible mustang uh, it, that would be cool wouldn't it no what? it was not that exciting oh, it was not? a pretty standard rental yeah. car I think it was slightly sporty. I seem to remember that we got something that would be fun driving up the 101. But I ask because uh, I did that trip. I was in my late twenties, and my wife and I did that in a convertible Mustang, nice. and had around in, in a space of about three years, about ten other couples did it, and then all everyone <laughs> had kids, and we thought we were really cool doing something really unique. And, and no, everyone was doing it around the same yeah. time. Do you, you know when he said. Um, living and working i wanted to live and work in new york do you know the one thing that popped into my brain immediately vodka martini oh interesting um, that was that was just that, that was i i didn't i didn't think about it it just that popped into my head i drank a, i was introduced to and uh, partook in a lot of vodka martinis when i lived in in manhattan uh, well it that was the appropriate thing to do it was living here that introduced me to, I guess I drunk champagne a bit, but it was living in New York that we really got into yeah. it. And that was our first date was at a champagne bar in New York. Oh, yeah? And since then, that is our drink of choice all the time. So New York definitely changed that. New York, is, it's fun. New York is a fun city. Wow. Okay. So here ever since, married, two kids. Let's go back to then. I can't, I've got, we've got to mind that because that must have been, frankly, terrifying. How old were you? The move itself, you mean? No, getting here and then it kind of like everything falling down around. Yeah, you. well, it's, it's weird, but... isn't it? So I, I teach change curves now. So, you know, since since I lost that career, I had to find a new one. So as you mentioned, I've been facilitating and, and teaching. And so it's a lot of leadership developments, a lot of personal development, sales training, more recently, a lot of diversity and inclusion. 
And one of the big things is going through change. And so the standard change curve, even if it's a good thing, you know, you get a burst of energy and fun, and then it, you'll have a crash. Something bad will happen. But for that first year, nothing bad happened. I just had an amazing time. Everything was everything you could want it to be. The city was amazing. I started dating this wonderful woman. It was brilliant. So it took a year for that crash. But when it came, yeah, it was huge. I had just upped and left. I was, you know, I was 32 when I got here, but I was single. I thought of myself as very sort of carefree. So, I, uh, you know, I had my two suitcases of stuff and that was it. But when they, when they, I walked into work that day, completely not, there wasn't an iota of me that thought I was about to lose my job at all. And, you know, they said, can you go and speak to the boss? And up I went. And like, yeah, we don't want you anymore, Howell. And I walked out and I sat in Central Park just staring at pigeons, thinking, what do I do now? Like, and you know all the worst things you think when you get let go. Like, yeah. I thought I was needed. I thought I was good at this. I thought they liked me. I thought I'd added to the company. And turns out, no, they don't. None of that was true. Like, you just didn't want me anymore. That's it. I'm gone. And so I think I did two more days in the office and so i can't remember exactly what day it was but let's say it was a monday by wednesday everything i'd spent 10 years my basic 20s had been at the ft that was what i did and knew and so yeah i was really befuddled and the worst bit is of course i couldn't work my visa was job it was oh, an l1 yeah, visa yeah. like i couldn't just go off and get another job so that was why we spent that six months and I burned through the cash. They were very generous with the redundancy. It was a good British company. You know, they paid me a month a year in redundancy money, but you live in Manhattan with no other money coming in. That goes fast. And so it was barely the end of the summer. It was April. I got let go. It was barely like October when we went on this vacation. But as I say, the vacation really was, let's see if we're going to get married. Because if we're not, <laughs> I, I got to go. I can't. There's no other how, way I can stay. How come you hadn't had to leave already? Had you gone out and come back in on a... a, uh, a I don't want to get thing? anyone into trouble, <laughs> so I won't specify specifically, but I will say that what then happened was we got back from San Francisco, went to see a lawyer and basically said, we want to get married, what do we do? And the answer was just get married now and deal with it after the fact. So, but we'd actually had a trip booked to the UK. I was going to take her back for Christmas, I think, that year, as I remember. And they basically said, like, don't, don't leave. If you leave and come back in and lie about why you're coming back, that's real trouble. But if uh -huh. you get married now and then deal with that after the fact, and so we went through the whole, you know, proper, we got married, we had to document our life together, we went for our uh, Are You a Real Couple interview, and uh, and I was I got really nervous on the day I was fine leading up yeah, to yeah. it, but yeah, when we got there and they were they were asking these questions like they, the the two funny ones were uh, how what's Annette's phone number? Well, of course, by two thousand nine we didn't know no. anyone's phone numbers anymore, yeah. so and we weren't allowed to bring our phones. So I went uh, uh, six four six and then just started saying numbers and Annette like my wife you know suddenly giggled and turns out I hadn't got like barely half of it right at all and uh, but she kept saying to me does does uh, does Annette have any brothers or sisters and I had said yeah yeah she's got an older brother and a younger sister and then like five minutes later does Annette have a, a any siblings and I was like yeah yeah an older brother and a young sister and she asked this like five times and then later on she said to my wife do you have any siblings and Annette went yeah an older brother and a younger sister so we finished and we said to our lawyer like that was weird you know and that they kept asking the same thing is that a trick to try and catch you out and he's like no nah, I think she just forgot that she was asking you and I, th I think it was more of a you seem legitimate let's go through this process you know given people who are in the room there. I think there were some more suspicious couples there than we were. And so they accepted our photos and our life. It, those meetings are incredibly daunting for us. Yeah. Right? And, but then I think you forget we're one. I mean, my, I think my last interview with the, with the uh, USCIS, I was in there maybe, maybe 20 minutes. So what's, what, what, what's he doing? Of the, he's doing 15 of those a day. You know, yeah, you're just another yeah. number, but the amount of power they they wield, and it's it's intimidating. And then you, but you're not thinking of it like I'm just one of fifteen, and there are some there's some questionable circumstances in this waiting room, I'm <laughs> yeah. sure. Right? Um, yeah, it's it's a very daunting process that people who have never had to go through anything like that 
can't really comprehend, I don't think. Um, oh, and, 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 you know, to the point of we don't believe you, we're sending you away. Like, that's, yeah. that's the ultimate yeah. thing. And so in the, no. in the room, I started, like, shaking, you know, genuinely. Yeah. No, it's it's even worse than that. I think how it's, it's like, oh, we don't believe you, so we're yeah. sending you away. Oh, and by the way, because we think you've lied to us, uh, you're not coming back to you. No, exactly. Like, you're down, and that's and that's it. Yeah, and then you're banned just came, completely. So I just I just came to to get let in forever, and you're just kicking me out for good. Like, yeah. wait, what just happened here? I'm spinning. Um, t- uh, tell me, you're. Going through the change management, you, mm. go, you plod along, and then there's this you, 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 the, the huge crash comes. Yeah. What, what happens next? I mean, I mean, what do you teach happens next? <laughs> well, so uh, so to you, you know, to your intro, and and obviously the other part of my life was this this writing part, and so of course, in ideal world, what I thought was like, okay, that'll be the kick up the ass I need to, you know, to go and do this properly. So I, w- I was with my wife and uh, a then girlfriend, and we were having a wonderful time. But actually, look, I had a bit of money. And I had this lovely apartment in New York. So I actually looked into house swapping with somebody in L.A. And the idea would be I would go out, you know, give myself six months and see if I could really make this work. And Annette was going to come with me. Like this wasn't instead of this was Annette going again. Her friends were saying, are you nuts? You're moving across the country with this guy. Like you just started (laughs) seeing him. But. Uh, so we tried to do it, and it just did they didn't. Give, did they give her a safe word? Like if you call up, and, and, <laughs> yeah, exactly, and say, yeah, badger. Then <laughs> uh, I, look, they didn't even deal with safe words. Her parents literally sat down and said, "We think you're a bad idea." And the funny thing was, I've never no. been the bad, like you know, problem guy. I was the one that everyone's parents wanted their daughters to date. I was so safe and boring, and suddenly I was this <laughs> like he's tried to trick you. So, but uh, but we so that was the plan potentially. And and it, and it didn't happen for various reasons. And then, you know, the money had sort of gone. And so it was like, well, we can't really do that. But but I was writing in those six months. I thought, like, let's really try this properly. And I did much better, but I still fell into my traps, which are too much procrastination, uh, too much um, dealing with rejection badly. So when I would send work out, if they didn't write back and say, that's the greatest thing I've ever read, Howell, you know, we want to offer you a job immediately, I would go, oh, well, what's wrong with it? You know, why did I bother spending months on this? And, and I would say, honestly, Richard, this is a definite British-American difference. So I, you know, grew up in worlds of actors and writers and directors and stuff. And many of them have come across to America in various forms, either when they were successful or when they were trying to be successful. But the difference that everyone has spoken about is Americans are just better at, number one, being told no. Americans just go, no, I think I'm going to do it anyway. Whereas British people have a definite sort of like, oh, really, I'm not allowed to do that? Like, okay, then, fair enough. But the other big one is, you know, even I was a working actor as a teenager, but I still didn't make a huge point of it because the stuff I did, I wasn't like a big star. I hadn't been in a big role. I was just in lots of small things. It's in Spender, the television show, if you remember, Richard, and like Catherine Cookson movies. And so it's not like I ran around telling people. Whereas, of course, in New York and L.A., when people are serving you food, they will just say bluntly, I'm an actress. You know, I just do this on the yeah, side yeah. like their job is an actress and as i had friends who went over for like pilot season where they would meet people parking cars and say i'm really a film director do you want me to park your car for you and we just don't do that in britain we would never dare say no. i'm a you film get, director out the pub. yeah like well what have you directed well nothing well then you're not a film yeah. director are you whereas the american mentality yeah. is i'm a film director i just haven't made anything yet like that's that's what well, I'm I mean, doing. It's, it's, it's the mirror image of that is the amount of Irish people who have who haven't set foot in Ireland. The family haven't been in Ireland oh, yeah. in 400 years. No, and I apply I'm applying the same rule to Italians here as well. You're not <laughs> Italian. You're just not. <laughs> but but happy to just be what I I honestly believe I am, and I will <clears throat> get there at some point. And I'm, I totally admit that wasn't my mindset. I was never good enough at just being able to say pick myself up and and go. And the problem was that most times I had a good corporate career running the same time, bringing in money. But at least at this period, I had nothing else. So, I, you know, there was this real drive of make this work, make this work. And I got much further. I did start having conversations with real producers. I was discussing with agents and being signed. I did get actual mm-hmm. writing work that paid. Um, so it was money, but it was it was far from a living, you know. And as the writer strike has just told us again... There's Emmy Award winning writers who are finding it hard to make an actual living as writers in Hollywood. So 
So, you know, when, when I had to, I got my green card in like late 2009, I guess it must have been, or early 2010. And I was definitely getting work by that point. But there was still, a, I, I, if I don't start making money soon, we can't, you know, we can't stay in New York. We can't do this. So that was when I went looking for a, a career that would take me on at that moment, because now I'd been out of work for a Hold year. On, wait, you, didn't, you didn't do the house swap and go to L.A.? No, no, it didn't happen. No. So I was, I was doing all this from New York, which is very possible, of course. Uh-huh. The two places you can get a big writing career going are New York and uh-huh. L.A., definitely. But, uh, but no, I was, I was still here. And I, who knows what difference it would have made. But if I'm being really honest with myself, Richard, not much. I think I would have just been in LA and made the same stupid mistakes. And you know, I, you've brought up this writer's strike and what's going on with AI and the, and the streamers. I mean, obviously, mm. you couldn't foresee the stream. Well, Netflix was around then, wasn't it? But it wasn't a streamer. Yeah. I, I wonder. I mean, I'm looking forward to getting into what you are doing now and 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 where this path has taken you. But when we get there, I, I'm interested to know whether you look back and you're like, you know, it happened for a reason. Uh, if I'd made it as a screenwriter, I'd be struggling now. It's it's. It sounds pretty brutal out there. Well, it wouldn't be. I, and look, I, it's one of those terrible things for anybody listening to this that wants to get into that world. What even is making it as a screenwriter? What does that even mean? Getting a film made? That's amazing. What an amazing feeling. But that doesn't guarantee you another job. You know, being a writer on a, on a show in the room, that doesn't mean there's work next year. It's a really hard career. And that was one of the reasons I didn't end up going into acting was I didn't want that kind of unknown quantity of where the next job was and some of my best friends who did you know went through all the highs and lows I had a best friend who ended up on a soap opera in the UK and was thus famous and rich for five years and after that he was just that guy on a soap opera who couldn't really get work because of it like all the worst things you think can happen to you as an actor is yeah and then but then I imagine that's particularly hard I mean when I was growing up Hollyoaks was big and then there's all these mm. like young kids who were in Hollyoaks and towards 16 17 year olds they were famous and then oh yeah it was amazing to do most of them go on to do nothing and no, they're never but going to and staggeringly they... jealous you know yeah but they had they had like a they must have had like a brief moment of fame mm. a load of money in the pocket and then lost all that cachet and money and that's got to be hard really hard i mean at least as a writer you're secretly not famous anymore you know most people <laughs> don't see you in the street and go you're that guy who used yeah. to write that tv show but it's still just as hard so to your point like what would have happened i can say this now wholeheartedly even though i try my hardest to help new writers so through the book that i wrote and through the course that i offer i am now happy to admit that if you actually said to me now at 47 you can have a career as a movie writer i don't think i would take it anymore i don't think it's a life i want to lead even if you could promise me that i made similar money i i enjoy the life i have too much i love living in connecticut i love honestly the job that i do that turns out is probably the job i should have been doing all those years because it combines all the pieces of who i am it's performance it's acting it's getting a room full of people clapping you which it turns out i needed more than i had forgotten over the years it's, oh, hard, you know, it's a bit of improv, it's a bit of stand-up, it's a bit of writing, like it's all of these things. And actually now just sitting in a room writing and having producers tell me what's wrong with my script, I, I don't think I'd enjoy that now, so. I, I'm, I, I'm, I really want to <clears throat> uh, dive into what you're doing currently, but just before we do. Yeah. Um, writing, right, it, mm. it surprises me how competitive uh, and how oversubscribed, um, for want of a better word, writing gigs are. Yeah. Because acting looks easy. I, I, I don't think it is. To be a good actor, I think is, you know, when you think of some of the acting performances, I think it's an incredibly skilled and, and difficult job. And I, and I guess one of the, I guess making it look easy is, is a skill in its own right. Yeah. But I think people gravitate to it because think, anyone thinks they can do that, right? But writing is hard. Good writing is very hard. So it surprises me how many people, how much, how many writers there are. Well, again, it depends what you call writers. It also depends what you call actors. Again, people with an equity card in the UK or even a SAG member over here or people who are actually making a full living doing it. But writing, look, anybody can put pen to paper and write a screenplay. And I'm going to suggest you do because you don't know how good you are until you've done it. And also, you're not going to be amazing the first time. Nobody is. Strangely, it is one of those worlds where people do think, if I just write a screenplay and send it off to a bunch of producers, I'll probably be able to sell it. 
Well, that's like saying if I just paint a picture, it'll probably go up in the Louvre. Like, no, it won't. It'll take you years to get that good. And the people who get there faced years of being told, give this up, this is stupid, and, mm. and who knows who breaks through. But look, you're never going to paint a picture good enough to get into the Louvre unless you start painting pictures. You're also never going to be a good writer or star writer until you start putting pen to paper and writing scripts. And the 10 to 20th, you'll go, I'm getting really good at this. So I, I would never tell anybody not to do it and try it. You want to try it, try it. But also don't go in with this idea that your first script is going to be Tarantino. Like, it isn't. There's a, he didn't just knock those scripts out of nowhere. He'd spent years to get that good, as did Aaron Sorkin, as did any writer you know about. So try it. But there are 50,000 scripts registered each year for movies with the Writers Guild, uh, essentially like to register it as like a you know, piece of copyright proof. Of those 50,000, you know, you're talking a couple of hundred that are of the quality to actually get bought by a major studio. And if you're lucky, 10 of those will get wow. made by each studio. So what wow. you know, readers have to do is wade through just yeah. acres and acres of nonsense. But again, um, the system is set up for that. So it's not don't do it. It's just understand you are in a staggeringly huge pool of people of which a very small number are going to actually make real money each year. But again, you're never going to get there unless you put yourself in that pool and start fighting hard. You just got to write. Well, the, the, I can't remember what the book's called. You probably know where you, they advocate. You just you get up and you write every day. You do ten lines or one page, whatever it is. Rain or shine, no matter how you feel, you just write, and that's how you you just build that muscle up. Well, yeah, um, you know, our our rule is not that much different. Uh, mine I sell to people is whatever f your free time is. Fifty percent of that should be spent writing. Because, again, you know, it's like saying I'm going to be a world class chef, but I'll do that by cooking one meal a day for me and my family. That's not going to happen. Like, it's got to now be a major part of your life if that's what you want to do. I think about all the, the unpaid man hours in those 50,000 scripts, because I imagine as well writing a screenplay for a movie, that t that's a project. That takes months or years. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Not like an acting job, you, say you do get an acting job, you turn up, well, how long, even these major movies take like three months to shoot, right? Whereas writing a screenplay for a movie, that's that could take months, years. Like it's a big, it's a big endeavor. It is a big, endeavor, a big endeavor. endeavor. And you know, and again, to, to the difference between acting, look, I can spend years auditioning and it's horrible being told no all the time. But yes, when I get a, a job, that's amazing. But you're right, I've literally poured three months to six months of my heart and soul and life into a screenplay. When I then get told it's terrible, there that's is hard. nothing more crushing in the that's entire hard. world. Yeah, it's really heartbreaking. And, yeah. and of course, the worst feeling is to get better, I've got to do that again. Like, can I really do that? And so the number of people who write one and never write anything else is very, very high indeed because that rejection and heartbreak after that first one is so hard. How oh, listen, I get it. I'm, I, I, I've, I've got... An for, for two decades in uh, career in persuasion and, and you know essentially sales, I've got incredibly thin skin. I, yeah. I put a lot of stuff out there into the world, and the other day, someone, a woman who doesn't know me, responded to one of my emails that she didn't believe I was British because I sounded too much like a second-hand American car salesman. And I just responded like, "Ouch, <laughs> it really hurts." And then she asked me where I was from in the Lake District, and I realised. Not only did she think I sounded like a second-hand American car salesman, she hadn't been re reading anything I'd been saying because. I do not live in the Lake District, and I never Where did have. she get Lake District from? Because the general yeah. assumption is when you say you're British, they go, where are you from in London? Yeah. And you go like, no, there's more than that in the UK, I promise you. It's not yeah. that big, oh. but it is bigger than London. So, uh, what, uh, One of my emails had, had referenced uh, learning to sail in, uh, in right, the Lake right. and, and somehow she ended up in... I'm not Brit. I, I lived there, so it was a very confusing experience. But I tell you what, it hurt and it lingered, and I remembered. And I'm talking about it now, two weeks yeah, later. Yeah. That's how thin my skin is. <laughs> I mean, look, I used um, to get crushed when people didn't want to buy ad space with the FT newspaper, and it's like, what do I care? You know, it's know. a huge newspaper, but still, I was selling it to you, and you saying no means that I feel I failed somehow, or I've let the paper down. So yeah, I, even I, in I that. I have it, and having your own business where you've like designed the proposition, you've you know you've crafted what you believe to be this like world-beating, yeah, you know, f unique offering, and then people people that aren't banging your door down, you're like, yeah, wait, wait, 
do, do, do you not realise? Have I? Where are you? Yeah, uh, I, I, it hurts. Um, how do you become a facilitator? Facilitator, facilitator, facilitator. <laughs> Why can't I say this word? <laughs> facilitator. There we go. All right. So facilitator. Uh, well, look, it's it's de- it's a it's a very interesting world in that. Um, I worked for many years for a British company called Mind Gym. They were just launching in the US at the time in 2010 as I got my green card. And so my brother had actually worked for them in the UK and he'd always said I would enjoy it. So I reached out to them. And what's wonderful about it is there is no real required background. Like Mm -hmm. looking at somebody's resume is a kind of waste. Like the only thing you need to know is that they've done some interesting stuff that they can share. Now, I was an interesting mix of things. So who makes a good facilitator? People who are good at performance. So I had that. People who uh, have corporate experience. So I was just coming out of nine years as a, I say sales director, and I was, but it's it's an easier term for describing what I was. But a middle manager, you know, of a, a team of kind of 15 by the end of it. And um, so I understood how companies work and what's most facilitating is speaking to corporate people, usually at quite big companies, can be small companies, but quite big companies. So knowing their real world is very powerful. Not I've I've always just taught the idea, but I have been in your shoes. I know what it's like to try and get stuff done in a big corporate entity. Um, But beyond that, honestly, what makes you great is obviously just an exciting, interesting, engaging person. And a resume can't tell you that at all. So I, I got the job and you got, I went through this week certification where they taught me how to be a facilitator. So I felt very comfortable presenting. Of course, as a salesperson, that's what I'd done for years. What I realized was I'd been presenting at people. And actually what facilitation is, but really now how I teach sales and anything like it is, converse with don't present at you're there to lead the conversation but the more you get people talking and doing stuff the much more engaged they are i'm sure you've been to corporate events richard where there's an entertaining person on stage and great i'll listen but if i'm just sitting here you've got maybe 20 minutes and after that my mind will start wandering pretty soon so so i i joined them freelancing uh, I did have my green card by this point. Wait, so so, so mind Jim, they yeah. are you're not you're not you're not facilitating for them. They've put you through a course to facilitate. Uh, no, I, I am out. then facilitating for them. So I oh, right, took okay. their facilitation course, but as in to certify to become one of their trainers. Uh, they called them coaches, but kind of in room trainers. Uh, how quick question? So I'm a big mm. corporate. Yeah. Uh, how does the conversation between me and my fellow big shots in the boardroom uh, end up going? Do you know what we need to hire a facilitator for this? How, wh- well, it definitely goes. We need to we need to do some training. So every big corporate entity has an L and D department, learning and development mm-hmm. department, and part of their job is and look, a huge amount of budget is set aside for. We need to be investing in our people. Now, sometimes it's we we honestly need to invest in them because we care about them. And sometimes it's we need to look like we're investing and do the (laughs) courses we need to do. But most of the time, I absolutely believe that they care about their employees and they want them to be as successful as possible. So whether it's general leadership training, we want our managers to be as good as possible. As I say, more recently, DEI training obviously has become much more prominent in the last eight years. One of the stories I tell is I was 25 when I became a manager at the FT for the first time. I had never heard the words diversity and inclusion at all. I just got set off to hire people with no real idea what I was doing and fell into all the traps you would fall into of hiring people who seem like you. You know, I genuinely, yeah, yeah, used to ask, what's your favorite movie? And if they didn't have one, I would think, well, then I'll have nothing to talk to them about. So, you know, they're not a good fit was a perfectly yeah. good reason to not give somebody a job. So I, I've, I've got to just jump in here and ask you yeah. then. Um, obviously, this DEI, DEI thing huge in the last few years uh, after George Floyd. Uh, so a lot of the criticisms out there are that a lot of companies are just paying lip service to it. So as someone who's seeing this across different companies, is your opinion it's lip service or it's a, there is a real sea change going about? don't care if it's lip service i honestly don't care if if you're doing some training on it people will walk out getting something from it 
most of us have never been engaged in this world at all. We've never once been asked to question how we speak to people or why we say certain things or why I tut when one person talks and engage with eye contact with another person. So I don't care if it's lip service, but if everybody gets exposed to the idea that whether you like it or not, you are just bias. You're not a bad human. You're just a human. But if you look at it and go, that is, why, why do I treat these two people so differently? Why do I make judgments so fast? And yes, why do I say certain things to certain people and not others? Why do I give this person more time than that person? So my whole style and mind Jim's style for many years was, we're certainly not here to tell you you've made mistakes. We're certainly not here to tell you you're a bad person. But we are here to make you think, I wonder why. I make certain choices in a room with different people. And for, let's face it, hundreds if not thousands of years, we've never really been asked to think about that. So this is a massive change in a very short space of time, how we deal with different colleagues and why. So I don't care the reason. What I do want is everybody leaving the room going, I, I will think about this differently now. I will challenge myself on, should I say this thing? And, you know... I don't agree with these people who are, oh, you have to worry about every single thing you say now. No, you don't. You just have to think about it for a split second and think if that's desperately rude, then no, I shouldn't say it. It's, it's not we're taking away the fun. We are just asking you, the world, not me, how the world is just asking us to be a little thoughtful about how we treat people and how we speak to them. And especially in a work context where... Now, what's the reality? Yeah, you can easily end up in court over it. So why don't you just stop and think, why would you say this at this time? Um, I've Did got I? to ask, though. Yeah. You know, I, I, I popped out. Something happened. My computer just shut down. But yeah. I've, I've, got, yeah, I've got to ask you, though, as you were saying that, listen, by the way, you are preaching to the choir here. I agree with you entirely. Um even if people, uh, companies or attendees aren't engaged, I'm glad they're having to sit through it because you can't help but learn something, right? But you said something then that is, I could just imagine getting the backs up of so many people still, unfortunately. You said, we're human. We're just biased. We have biases. Some people react really badly to that. And 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 it, it seemingly, there's no getting through to them, seemingly. They just will, you know. They just will not accept that, you know, they don't see color or whatever, whatever it is, they refuse to accept. So how have you, how have you dealt with that? You must have come up against that repeatedly over the last few years. People, rea people say, no, no, I don't, I don't see color. I don't see sex. I treat everyone as I, as, as, I, as I want to be treated. But I think that, again, look, my whole job is to see everybody coming from the best place. Uh, anyone who's willing to say that to me wants to feel of themselves as a good person. And nothing I'm saying is about okay. you're, you're not at all. Okay. Uh, actually, to that statement, we are all biased. Honestly, in eight years of doing that and 14 years of general facilitation now, I've never had one person stand up and say, I'm not biased, Howell, because by that point, we've got to a point in the discussion. So here's a very easy game that I play with, and I'll play it with you now, Richard. It's called Trigger Differences. What are the things that other people do that are strangely small but have an outsized emotional reaction in you? Because of who you are, because of the life you've led, these things just drive you nuts. I will give you mine. I've got slow talkers. I think we can all tell how all thinks and talks quickly. So when somebody's a slow talker, I just want to talk over them and finish their sentences. Yes. The other yes. one is people who listen to their phones uh, without headphones playing music through the phone. I don't know where that came from, but they're all the most evil people in the world. Now, I know that's petty and stupid and wrong. They're no better or worse than me. It doesn't matter. That's my view on the world, and I will always consider it wrong. So come on, Richard, what are your trigger differences? Well, look, I've got to say, slow talkers, I, they, they doesn't trigger me, but I absolutely um, have got to jump in there. I, I really struggle not to finish sentences. I know how rude it is. The, the, and I've got to just tell you, the, the people who uh, have their phone, people go to the beach with a, um, a, a, a subwoofer or whatever you call it nowadays and have it on too loud and inflict that on everyone else around them, uh, people who have the phone on loud uh, drive me insane. Uh, and the one that springs to mind here is uh, it, uh, people who undertake on the um, people who use the the lane for coming onto a motorway or an interstate or a dual carriageway to undertake you in a traffic jam. I want to throttle them. Oh yeah, I want yeah, to physically absolutely. Hurt them. 
I guess. Well, yeah. I, hey, look, if we want to talk differences between America <laughs> and Britain, you know, I'm not saying people in Britain are good at lane management at all, but it is substantially worse here. And yes, the misunderstanding of when you're merging and that that's an exit lane, I, I completely agree. But here's the thing. Look, I, there are other people who are not bothered by that. But your bias, this just sets you off completely. And so once we've got people thinking about stuff like this, it's very hard for anyone to sit in a room and go, I'm not biased. What they mean is I'm not evil. What they mean is I'm not cruel to people. I don't try and hurt them. And I absolutely agree. But uh, micro messaging and specifically microaggressions are those tiny little things you do that you don't realize but have, again, an outsized reaction in others. So as I say, talking over one person and listening with rapt attention to the other why? What's the difference here? Why do you treat them differently? So a story I tell, I used to work with somebody, I won't say his name here, but uh, he used to go off topic in meetings all the time. And apparently, I honestly didn't know this, but I would make this noise. <laughs> and eventually my boss said to me, you've got to stop making that noise when this person is talking. And I'm like, what noise? What are you talking about? And he said, everybody knows it. And you always do it when he's chatting. And it wasn't even, I, I will take that out of microaggression. It was just an aggression. But honestly, it was subconscious. He just used to drive me nuts in meetings. And so stopping and questioning all these little moments is all we're asking people to do. There is no, you know, this, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Uh, not, not criminal theory, you know, strange right wing theory that all these trainings are about telling white people they're doing something wrong. Yeah. That's not yeah. what it is. I don't care who you are or where you come from. And I do make the joke. I know your listeners can't see me. I am a white, middle-aged, middle-class, cisgender guy. Like, that's who I am. I don't care who we are. There is no right or wrong person to talk about this. We've all just got a question. I wonder why I react to certain people in certain ways. Yeah, t tangentially related. I actually was thinking this morning about some slight I'd received so long ago, right? Yeah. I, I, something someone had said to me in work, I can't even think what it was now, but there's a few things that I can just remember vividly that are so innocuous, but obviously upset me at the time. And this is from 5, 10, 15, 20, 20 years ago even, really. And today, for the first time, I flipped on its head and I thought, because I can be quite uh, brusque and impatient. I can be really impatient, you know, the slow, mm. the slow talking thing would trigger me. I thought, what have I said to people that someone else, somewhere in the UK, when they think of me, they think, ah, oh, what a dick that guy said that thing to me t 15 years ago. And I'm, you know, it's, I, I, it's just gone. Lots of like, them. Lots of them, Richard, yeah, I promise so you. so much. I wasn't very thoughtful uh, or self-aware uh, in my younger days. And um, I often think about that, like the the damage that we've we've wrought as we've moved through the world. Um, yeah. and I And I do think... The pendulum is swinging as a society, as, a, as, as people are, um, Me Too, Time's Up, uh, the, the, uh, this DEI movement, it's, yep. it's, it's all moving in the right direction. Um, and, I, and I really, Generation X get a lot of stick, um, but I've got, I've got high hopes for them. If, they, if they're bringing up and they're, they're um, indoctrinated is the wrong word, but you know what I mean? They're, they're I know, also it, how, we're, how we're raising children. Well, I, uh, yes, yeah. of course. I do think our generation, so mine are, two children are 10 and 9 and yeah I think they live in a very different world a big one yeah. is I really think bullying is treated very very differently in schools now and chatting to my English friends British friends it seems to be different there as well but that just how it's expected or you know of our age group as I say I'm 47 but bullying wasn't something that you you, you wondered whether it would happen like you were just gonna get bullied or you were gonna be the bully and if I'm being really honest Richard I'm a little ginger guy with a stupid name. And I moved house when I was seven to a new town where I sounded idiotic to people in Newcastle. As you can tell, I've got a very flat English accent. I now say Newcastle because of 14 years of living there. But I said Newcastle when I got there and people would keep getting me to say the word Newcastle. And I would say Newcastle and they would laugh at me and I didn't know why. Sorry, they'd laugh at me. I said it wrong because I was doing long A's. But, uh, but I turned to bullying people if i was going to be the target uh -huh. let me get there first and so uh -huh. it it taught me to be funny and it taught me to win over a room so that i wouldn't be the target and so i feel absolutely dreadful about some of the things i did to kids through those years 
And I do honestly believe that schools, teachers and the way parents just speak about it to their kids, it's different. I'm not saying bullying doesn't exist. They're kids. It's just going to. But it's definitely treated differently and not expected as just part of childhood in the same way that it was for us, I don't think. Good. I didn't know that, you know. Uh, uh, This hasn't come up before. I've got a four-year-old and a one-year-old and the four-year-old just started at school um, or pre-K. Yeah, but he's at the school. He, he could be at the school through to his eighteen, and um, yeah, it's one of the things you think about. One of the things you worry about, and yeah. uh, and I kind of hope that because I feel that we're moving into a different society. But you just think kids are kids, you know, bullies are going to bully. Um, but if it's to hear it's treated differently, it's not just like it's just not just accepted. Like it's just part and parcel of growing up, as it which is wild to us. And, right, and I, I think guess. kids are taught um, acceptance in a different way now. You know, and and again, just to put it on topic of this, I think that's cross country. I think in Britain and here, you know, kids are taught uh, and not just formally taught, but I think everything they see, everything they read, YouTubers, you know, Mr. Beast's transsexual friend, like all of these things are just teaching them these ideas in a very different way than uh, we were exposed to them or taught them or we just had to figure this out on our own yeah. and most of us were nice people who didn't want to hurt anybody so yeah. no problem we'll we'll understand this but i but, I but think also they feel we, different. Were, we were under pressure to conform and anything that wasn't quote unquote normal you know you you know you, you just wanted to fit in um but you yeah know, i'm not we're not saying there's no homophobia we're not saying there's no racism but i will tell you one thing that i truly appreciate now representation matters yeah having a black president mattered having gay people trans people colored people everywhere in positions of authority women sorry it matters that's why this that's why the makeup of the boardroom matters you well know. so if you're interested in 2001 when i started at the ft marjorie scardino was ceo of pearson that owned the paper she was in 2001 the only female head of a fortune 500 company today at my wow. last count i think there are 44 and whenever I say that number, people go, oh, that's that's good. <laughs> like, well, it's a lot better, but it hasn't fixed the problem of 51% of the country no. only being less than 10% of CEOs. But OK, then, yes, we're definitely moving in the right direction. So, yes, there's lots of very, very positive things. It's in no way fixed. And, you know, there's uh, many, many more years to go. But tell you what, though, imagine being the only one. I mean, she must have been a powerhouse right oh, to, she was amazing to... she was genuinely amazing like, yeah. I, not like i hung out with her or anything but in the times <laughs> you know she did her speeches Martin for us and stuff York. yeah yeah <laughs> me and marjorie were best friends no she left us to go and work for um uh clinton uh all right completely why, why is her name completely gone from my head hillary Hillary Clinton, sorry, there you go, well done. Uh, she went to, wrote for Hillary's campaign, and uh, I guess for what transpired to be the 2008 election, I guess, when, you know, it, it moved over to Obama. So And so I was there for that for that election, and of course it was really fascinating, because I'm, I'm happy to admit now I wasn't really au fait with American politics particularly, uh, yeah. other than watching the West Wing. So that was my entire knowledge of american politics and so i didn't really understand the election in quite the way i certainly didn't understand how transformational it was to the people who were here i didn't i didn't realize it was that big a shift in you know what it meant and so you know the yeah. 15 years since have been very different <laughs> yes um okay so <clears throat> you are very british very English. Oh, should I, can I say that? Can I say Welsh? You're very British. Yeah. Let's just stick with British. Yeah, okay. we're e- very English with a Welsh name, yes. <laughs> very English with a Welsh name. Um, you, but you've been in America for quite a long time now. And you've got yeah. an American wife and American kids. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you have dual citizenship. Citizen but kids, Americans. but yeah. yeah, yeah. But, so how do you now... Are you American? Are you British? How, how do you see yourself? Honestly, I still do actually see myself as British. Uh, So somebody once said a lovely phrase, and I've stolen it from them, which is, I think I was American, I was just born in Britain. So the moment I got here, I just felt instantly comfortable. I suited the people more, I suited the atmosphere more, I felt comfortable and happy in a way that I never felt at home, and I couldn't really explain why. But, But no, I still think of myself as very British indeed. I still 
love having my British passport. So I'm not a citizen. I haven't haven't gone for it. I've just renewed my green card after 10 years. So I've got another 10 years on it. We've had discussions, my wife and I, about whether I go for citizenship. And the thing that stopped me, because I'd really like to vote, obviously, is... Um, is the tax implications of then going home and yeah. having to potentially pay tax here as well. And But let's be honest, I think I'm using that as a perfectly easy financial crutch to not do it. And and, and part of it is because I, ju I still do think of myself as British. I just love it here. How that's a very real concern. I, even if you're using it as a as a, a crutch or a reason pro to procrastinate, I've just today on LinkedIn, uh, I'm connected to a an American in Switzerland. She's a financial advisor there, and she's posted. There's an article in a, in a German newspaper today about how um, couples are splitting up because one of them is American, mm. and it's so complicated. And it's right, so right. many difficulties and challenges that the couples are splitting up over it. And I commented, like, I've not read the article, but I, I believe the premise. It is, it, it you know, I've heard, I've heard a um, an American tax lawyer refer to being an American abroad, an expat abroad, as akin to having a disability. Yeah, no, um, I, I'm. It's, it's very complicated. Bad. Yeah. Now, I have taken citizenship because I have, my two kids are American. Mm. And you know we're that and that we're, we're committed to raising them here, so we're looking down the thick end of twenty years. Got business here, and I was like, you know, I don't want, even if it's irrational, I, I just you know, if, going through customs on a green card. I know yeah. it's permanent. I know it's legally binding, all that, but I just wanted extra like, security. My kids are here, and I just <clears throat> I made that decision. But I, I would tell people unless you are absolutely committed. Hot, be very just be mind just just go into it with your eyes open yeah i think a lot of people will take it and then find out later on but oh, it's not easy just to walk away from a green card there's there's challenges with that as well you should be aware of but um I, oh, I, interesting. I, don't I mean i know i haven't really researched it that that much i'm very and i'm and i'm very comfortable with the situation as it stands so my wife is polish heritage her parents were polish. both polish so she's actually got a polish passport as well so you know, getting around the world is not a is not a hassle for us. So there's no reason to immediately change my situation, other than I feel bad not being part of the political process here. That yeah. definitely feels like a big miss in that sense. You know, we just voted last week, and uh, it it means something. I, and, I, mm. and I didn't, and I never. I'm you know we're classic British took all this for granted, took democracy and everything for granted, um, and the rule of law and all that good stuff. And then when you can't vote and things like Brexit happen, yeah, yeah, I, uh, I, um, you, I really felt it. So we've been able to vote in the last couple of cycles, well, last year and then this year, and it and it felt it felt it feels really good. Even though you know, what, what does my vote do? But there is just something about participating. It, it matters, and, it, and the older yeah. I get, the more it matters because I'm getting older. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and more boring. Um, <laughs> so do you, could, do you think there's a chance you'll go back? I'd be very surprised other than uh, obviously in, and this is not just true of America, this is true of home as well, but were political situations to go more bonkers than I feel comfortable with, we have discussed it, but my wife's parents are here. We have an amazing life here. I have no desire to leave whatsoever. I'll just, I guess I'll say, let's never say no to anything. But no, there is no plan at all in my mind for it. Whichever side of the aisle you're on, they're pretty bonkers right now. Actually, not just here, in the UK as well. Yeah, UK absolutely. Bonkers. And it just... We just kind of like... Everyone, it just feels like every, the the majority of us are just kind of hoping and waiting for it to pass. This too shall pass. Mm. And it will. Or it won't. And then that's really bad. But the chances of that, are, you know, history suggests that's not the way it's going to go. Mm. Um, but I think we're all just hoping. This is the madness, the divisiveness, the, the the shouting and the hollering and the ugliness. It's ugly right now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I don't know, I don't know where it goes. But as I say, it's not like I'd go home and I'd be happy with the political situation and feel comfortable. No, no. So it's not. It's not yeah. like there's a reason to do it for that at all. Yeah, I, I have a, I have like a, I have my eye in Europe one day, but I don't know. It's just grass is always green. You know, you're always. I'm. I think the expat thing is you're always just. I've moved from different countries. I've moved from different towns. I'm always itching to move, and I mm. where I am now, as long as I've been since I, since before college actually, um, and you just. I'm just always itching to move, and 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 I, and I never know what is a genuine. Like 
wish to be somewhere else versus yeah. what is just an itch that I want to scratch. And I don't know the answer to that. Mm. I don't know if there is an answer. Well, um, eight years is the longest I've been anywhere. And so once I've done nine years, and as in in a house, so nine yeah. years here, but the, we think this is our forever home. So that's our plan. Nice. Right. Well, let me ask you a question. So this is a podcast about being Amer- uh, a, a, an expat in America. So I'm kind of forced <laughs> Against my will, but not really against my will, because I like to asking about it. I'm forced to ask about what what the American dream, what it means to mm. you. Do you even believe in it? Is it a thing? So, if I just put that question to you, what does what does the American dream mean to you? Uh, so, I heard this in your other podcasts, and I think this does go back to what I was talking about earlier, which is the idea. I think there is an underlying idea in America of if you want it and if you try, you can achieve it. And I think that, to the idea we were talking about, writers, directors, actors, all just saying, I am a director, I am an actor, I'm just going to do that. I think that's the pervasive feeling of the American dream, that if we are honest, doesn't feel that way in Britain. There is more of a feeling of, you know, that could be possible, but you understand all the pitfalls and you'd have to think really, really hard about that. And that's what leads to us being much more hedging about will I achieve this or let me just let me just put it in the back you know burner but not tell anybody about it and I think you know that's a positivity that I love about America I I do think of course that idea of the American dream has caused as many problems as it's caused wonderful things you know the famous one being that everybody thinks they're going to be super rich at some point so everybody honestly believes they're going to be one of that top 0.1 percent and they don't want it being taxed accordingly it's a bizarre thought we all have and so it has its challenges but I do like that optimism I do like that feeling of it's open to you it's not always about money but it's about anything you just want to be something that is possible in this country and if you walk into any bar and start talking about it the room will go we're on your side you can achieve that let's go and do that together and I didn't feel that at home in the same way and it's one of the big loves I have of this place have you heard about the study? You, there's a study with fleas. They put fleas in a in a bucket. Have you heard that? No. There's a study where they put fleas into a bucket of, or some sort of container, right? And then the fleas, but the fleas can easily jump out. And then what they do is they put uh, some cling film over the top of this bucket, and the fleas jump up and they hit the cling film and they fall back down. Right. Right. Then after after a while, they take the cling film off. But the fleas only jump up to the, the previous height of the cling film. Right, they can't right. jump out because they've been conditioned to only jump that high. Mm. And that's when you're saying that about the UK. That I kind of feel that that's. I I I I, I, got to, I love the humbleness, the humility. But I love kind of the piss taking. If you say you're a, if you say you're an actor when you're washing cars, your mates are going to rib the hell out of you for it. I love that. But there is absolutely this sense of like keeping you in your place and not going for stuff because you fear being ridiculed. It, you know, whether it's your mates in the pub ridiculing you or whether it's like yeah. the much more um, permanent institutional uh, strictures that are in place that yeah. stop us going places. It feels like it's a real thing that's born over centuries. Um, and I love it. But, I, you know, there's a reason I'm here as well. I don't yeah. want to be constrained by it. Um, I don't just be this boy from Bolton who you know who's who's doing a certain thing and and will reach a certain level and that's it. I want to reinvent myself and grow and mm. learn and 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 feel I'm in a, an environment where that's supported and and uh, and it can happen. So you might have you kind of answered this question, but it is subtly different. But what's your American dream? I, I, we've talked about what the American dream means to you, but what, what's your... If you could paint a picture, what's your American dream? Yeah, I, listen, this is going to sound horribly smug, but I honestly feel I'm living it in in many ways. Like, what did I think I was coming here for? I hoped that I would meet somebody wonderful that I adored to bits. I hoped that I would find a wonderful life that I couldn't have at home, which in terms of the property we live in and the space we have and the things I do, none of that would be possible at home without making substantially more money, you know, that I hoped I would do a job I love and I've honestly found it. And, you know, back to the other piece of my life that I felt I could help people 
And through the, the book I wrote and the, the screenwriting course I offer people, I honestly feel like I help people to grow and be what they want to be. And so it's, I don't, I don't want to sound so smug, but honestly, I'm not saying my life is perfect. I get frustrated and annoyed and, you know, money's worries and all the normal stuff. But there's very little that I can point at and say, what did I come here for? You know, oh, my God, this wasn't what I thought it was going to be. This is what I thought it was going to be. And I'm living it. And it's fantastic. And it will continue to adapt and change. But that's the reason to your question earlier. I, I see no reason to go home. I came here and I achieved what I wanted to. So, dude, you found the path to happiness. That's I'm. Just, there's a, I've came across a quote in my notes yesterday. I'm gonna see if I can find it. That is, uh, it, this is. I heard this. This is from James Clear's incredible uh, weekly uh, letter. Mm. He has a quote, a newsletter. James Clear, the guy who wrote Atomic Habits. The real right. things haven't changed. It is still best to be honest and truthful to make the most of what we have to be happy with simple pleasures and to have courage when things go wrong right you've just you found the path to happiness you just you you're blissfully happy with the life you've built here <laughs> I mean, and that's... let's let's not go so far as blissfully happy if you <laughs> okay, never okay, you never know okay. there might be All right. something down the line like my kids know that I get frustrated and annoyed sometimes, but but there's no there's no no there's definitely no big thing like oh, if that was just not there I'd be happy you know I've I've cleared all those big things out I've got all the big things I want and and I, I certainly wouldn't tell everybody that America is the path to happiness but I do think for a certain set of people from Britain you will find a different world here a different attitude and a different set of people that if you don't feel you found them at home, it's it's possible to find that world here more than we than we know. Awesome. Well, look, I think that's a, the perfect place to end it. So um, where can people find you, Howell? So I think they've got my name in your podcast, and so I'm literally the only Howell Berry in the world, folks. So if you just <laughs> no. type it into, into Google, I, I will pop up in every place. But LinkedIn, Start I'm the only IMDb. one. Star, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, go and visit my page. It'll bump me up from 800,000 on the star meter. But, uh, but also uh, I, I, for the screenwriting course, it's screenwritingjourney.com and uh, pop in there. And if you sign up, it's a lifelong subscription and I'll be here to help you on your journey and basically avoid all the pitfalls that I fell into. That's what the course is about. It's getting them on the right path that I missed. So come and find me fantastic right well you heard it folks go and find him uh thank you so much for being a wonderful guest on always next part i really appreciate it it's been a it's been a great chat thank you thank you very much